All right, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Um, I'm going to read uh, just a couple of texts to you. Chapter 7, I'll start with verse 1, then we're going to jump down to verse 12. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you give will be the judgment you get. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. Everybody say hypocrite. Hypocrite. (laughs) It's going to be that kind of night. (laughs) You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Jump down to verse 12. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the law and the prophets. Verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Everybody say sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Say ravenous wolves. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, thus you will know them by their fruits. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you who behave lawlessly. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? Praise God. Um, I, have a, I have a rule whenever I'm reading the Bible, uh, and I, I think I inherited this from uh, just some of the, the influences that have influenced me uh, theologically and in my Bible study. But my, one of my rules when I'm reading the Bible is this. It's that whenever I'm reading the scriptures, whatever comes to me first, whatever, when I read something and, and, and a meaning comes to my mind, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. <laughs> my first inclination, oh, I'm reading this text. Oh, that's what it means. I'm pretty sure, no, that's not what it means. We don't sit with the text long enough to let it trouble us. Scriptures are very easy to misread. The ones that are the most easiest to misread are the ones that you've read the most. Um, The early fathers would say it like this, that Jesus, and Pastor Brian uh, hinted at this earlier, Jesus is humble, so he hides himself in the pages of Scripture, waiting for us to come and find him. Just like he hid himself in the temple and Mary and Joseph had to go find him, in his humility, he hides himself in the scriptures waiting for us to come find him. So you can't barely halfway read three parts of a verse on your way driving down the interstate and think, oh, look, revelation. We have to sit with it. We have to let it trouble us. Miss Karen told me a story last night. We were uh, at her house eating, and she told me that the Lord had been leading her to pray the Lord's Prayer. And she was praying the Lord's Prayer, just praying it. And then she gets to that line, let your kingdom come. She stopped there. She stopped there. And we think we know what that means. You've said the Lord's Prayer a thousand times. If you played sports in high school, you and all the heathen degenerate teammates prayed it together. (laughs) Right? We always prayed the Lord's Prayer and then a Vince Lombardi quote. If you have dedication and pride and never give up, you'll be a winner. The price of victory of high, but so are the rewards. We never saw those rewards where I went to school, but I trust Vince was right. And she got stuck on that line, your kingdom come, your kingdom come. And, and after you sit with it for a while, it starts, to, it starts to expand. It starts to stretch your mind. It starts to, starts to mess with you in ways that just a simple brief reading over it doesn't 
doesn't hit you. She talked about how when she started praying, let your kingdom come, God starts highlighting to us just how attached to the kingdoms of this world we really are. Even though we claim that we're not. Right? We're the holy, set-apart, remnant bride of Christ. Okay, I get it. Um, And we are in some ways. And we're not in other ways. We're profoundly worldly in some ways. And so one of the things that I think is the most challenging, and Dr. Alexander taught a class on this at RSM, when, especially when we read Jesus' sermon, if there's anything that I think gets misread, it's Jesus' most famous sermon. You've heard it your whole life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And we just say, amen. What does that mean? Ah, I don't know, but it's good. Jesus said it. I believe it. Don't understand it, but still believe it. And Jesus gets over into uh, Matthew chapter 7 when he's teaching his sermon. And I remember reading this, and and I've heard this a thousand times. If you grew up in the kind of church I grew up in, you always heard the scripture. Always. If it wasn't the main text that was being preached from, it was at least referenced. Straight is the gate. Right. Right? Any good holiness preacher Pulls that out of their tool bag. You ain't even preaching right if you had not quoted that one. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. And we would always hear that and we would say yes. Because we were certain we were on the narrow way. There was no doubt in our minds. We were Mount Pleasant Free Will Baptist on Highway 44 in Britain, Alabama. And we were on the narrow gate. And we could name for you everybody that wasn't. But we knew that we were. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Kevin? We were on the narrow gate. And we, we never really defined what the narrow gate was. It was just understood. It was understood in our language. Somebody say, wide gate, and you're like, yeah. What that means is all the stuff you shouldn't watch or listen to. Or do, that's the wide gate. All the stuff that I don't want to do anyway, that's the wide gate. Yeah. (laughs) When I was a kid growing up, the wide gate was blue jeans for women. (laughs) They, they They just say the word wide gate and everybody's like, yes, get the pants off these women and put the dresses back on, glory to God. Whatever happened to holiness? I have an aunt. Her name is, she's not really my aunt. We just called her aunt. That's what we do. Her name's Aunt Bernice. She's 176 years old. And to this day, she has still never cut her hair. And I've never seen her wear anything but the same denim dress down to her toenails and down to her wrist. It don't matter when the heat index is 115. She's going to walk holy before God. We used to have to go over to her house. She didn't even have a TV. It's the most frustrating season of my life as a young kid. Having to go to her house, just sit there. No toys. You can't smile. You for sure don't have playing cards in the house. Jeans were the narrow, the, 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 the wide gate. Jeans were the wide gate. And then, you know, we progress a little bit and the wide gate becomes something else. When I got a little older, you know what the wide gate was? Pokemon. You couldn't watch Pokemon serve God? What's the matter with these people? I went to church one time. They preached against the Smurfs. They did. Bunch of demons walking around, getting inside your kids. Like, man, a lot. <laughs> the wide gate. And that's not how Jesus defines it at all. We take our personal convictions... And we turn them into the narrow gate that everybody has to walk. And that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus actually names for us explicitly what this wide versus narrow gate is. And he says it in the preceding verse. In everything you do, treat others the way you want them to treat you. For the gate is narrow. Remember how I told you our first readings are normally wrong? 
We were so convinced we were walking the narrow gate. And the worst possible thing that a sinner could ever do would be encounter us. Because we were not going to treat you rightly. You were the plague. You were the outcast. The people that didn't think like us or believe like us or vote like us or act like us. The narrow gate is how you are treating those around you. You're not holy because you don't watch or do watch certain things. God is more, God's, God is absolutely consumed with us moving toward one another, not away from one another. And I don't mean us just moving toward each other in this room. I mean moving toward everybody in this city. We always define sin as all of the things that we are not supposed to do. And our greatest sins are not us doing all of the stuff we're not supposed to do. And there are things you don't need to do. RSM. There are things you don't need to do. Do you understand? Yes. 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 You understand. (laughs) Our greatest sins are not us doing all the things we're not supposed to do. Our greatest sin is all of the good that we refuse to do. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, James said. To him it is sin. This is the Lord's brother. To him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. I know you don't watch this and listen to that and talk like that, but what about all of the people you don't say hello to? What about how you treat that waitress when they're understaffed and overworked and your water's halfway low? Right? What about how you treat that person on the customer service line that barely speaks English? What about your impatience in the checkout line when there's an elderly person in front of you and you got places to go? And we treat them and we, we, we treat people in outrageous ways. And the worst part of this is when we do it in the name of our own holiness. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm holy. You might get sinner juice on me. Right? You might get sinner juice on me. Can't let the sinners be around. Jesus never moves away from broken people. He is always moving toward broken people. And to the degree that we move away from them is to the degree that we are not like him. And I'm talking about the most broken people you can think of. I'm not talking about your buddy that's Baptist. I'm talking about the most broken people you can think of. If we are not moving toward them, Jesus says we are walking the wide gate that leads to destruction. It gets worse. He's just warming up. What do we call the verse? And everything do to others as you would have them do to you. We call it the golden rule. Yeah? The narrow gate is the golden rule. The golden rule is the narrow gate. If we're not living by that rule, In every interaction that we have. We have this thing in our minds. I don't know how far down the road to go here. I was going to preach on this and then I said not to, but I won't go too far, hopefully. But there's no promises being made. We have this idea. Let me back up and say this. I'm not sure where we where we got the idea. That when a wrong is done to me, I can expect God's vindication in this, even in this life. That's why we don't bear wrongs well. That's why we don't suffer injuries well. Because I'm child of God. Ain't nobody going to treat Get, get me, you better start honoring me. And so, so we, we've done something weird. We've, we've, we, don't, we don't really even obey unless we can figure out which promise is attached to it. It's like, forgive, and then God will kill them. 
right? If your enemy's hungry, feed him, because then you'll pour coals of fire on their head. It's like, now we're talking. Right? Be humble. Okay. And then the Lord will raise you up. Yes. We have to have a promise attached to obedience. Before, before you give, we have to tell you all the awesome things that God's going to do if you give. Because our obedience has to be attached to something. Because obedience for the sake of being like Jesus isn't enough. And so our entire walk with God is transactional. I put in the debit card of obedience and you give me out what I want and need. And the entire New Testament is the story of people being done wrong and some of them never being vindicated in this life. <laughs> Paul's like Jesus and gets beheaded. It's Revelation 5 is the story of martyrs still after their death praying under the altar. Lord, when are you going to avenge us? That's right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Obedience for the sake of obedience isn't enough. We have to have something. It's awfully quiet in here. Y'all are right. This is the first verse Jesus said. We have, to have, we have to have a promise of divine reward attached to our obedience to sell people on it. And you might suffer wrongs and they never be made right in this life. This is Peter's, it, this is all of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. It's really bad. But there's a promise laid up for you. Whoa, not here. In heaven. Yeah, th- th- that bothers me a little bit because I remember, I, and I grew up, and I even I partook of it a little bit, of, of hating on the previous generation for talking about heaven so much. There was a reason why they did that. First of all, they were actually suffering. Me and you, not suffering. We're not suffering. Right. They were suffering. And they knew God's going to vindicate us. And we're not even looking for it in this life. We're looking for it in the next one. So we're going to sing about what God's going to do for us. And then we come along in the 21st century like bunch of fools. Sing about heaven all the time. As you tweet from the beach on your iPhone about how foolish they were. And they were having kids in the field and then continuing to, to, to work after they just gave birth. And all they had to give them any sort of hope was talk about the life to come. And everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. What time did I start preaching? Does anybody know? Like an hour ago, feels like. No, 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 no. So Jesus redefines the narrow gate. And then Jesus goes further, as he always does. This is what I mean, sitting with Jesus until he troubles you. Sitting with what he says until there is a reckoning. Then Jesus goes on and he says this. You will know them. Beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, They are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Now, again, this is one of those texts that when I was young, we would quote, never define it. We just understood what it meant. It was just a collective, yeah, it's good. You will know them by their fruit. And we knew what fruit meant. In, in, our, in our culture, fruit, good fruit means success. Yeah. Money. You're making a good living. Got married. Got some kids. Nice house. You can go vacation when you want. And we say things like this. They've got good fruit in their life. In ministry, it's the same thing. Ministry fruit is success. They built a big church. They have, they're, they're powerful. Whatever we think that means, they're powerful. They've got a lot of money. 
they got like 40,000 Instagram followers. <laughs> That's fruit. And then Jesus goes on and says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, did we not cast out devils in your name? I thought that was fruit. Did we not heal the sick in your name? I thought that was a sign that God is with them. Did we not do many miraculous works in your name? And Jesus says, I'll say to him, I, will, I never knew you. The miracles for Jesus are not fruit. The miracles are the clothing that the wolves wear pretending to be sheep. The miracles are sheep's clothing. I grew up with this idea. I should have preached something more exciting. I grew up with this idea. I was, I was taught this growing up. That the more pure you are, the more powerful you'll be. And so we gave our lives for purity. So that when we got the mic, we could be powerful. And we automatically thought that if you're powerful, it's because you're pure. Well, that's not true at all. You can be, say, five minutes, meet eight Christians, and no, that's not true. Power and purity have nothing to do with one another. This is, this is exactly what Paul is saying, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul did not write so you could share it at a wedding. It is a rebuke. In 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about spiritual gifts. And in 1 Corinthians 13, he's saying all of that stuff going on in 12 and 14 does not matter. Because y'all are carnal and hateful and backbiting and divisive. But love endures long and is patient and kind. I don't care if you move a mountain. That is not fruit. I don't care if you have all revelation and speak with the tongues of angels. That is not fruit. And in chapter 14, when he starts talking about the gifts, he even goes on to say, you need to seek out prophecy only so we can minister to your neighbor. Not so you can look powerful. Even the gifts that God gives us is not about us. You are not anointed for yourself. You are anointed for the sake of the world. It is an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. And it is a more evil and adulterous generation that seeks to work those signs. I had somebody send me something the other day. Uh, <laughs> you know how you, you get to this place in your life and it's like the other day and it's like four years ago. <laughs> I had somebody send me this the other day. You know, 2017. And uh, I was, I was shocked. You ever just see something that's like, this isn't good for my spirit. I need to, I need to get off here. Yes. Kind of like this sermon. <laughs> Not good for your spirit. <laughs> I, uh, Somebody sent me this, this link, and I, I, I still can't believe that, that, that I witnessed this. They sent me this link, and the link was a, a minister selling an online course. It was a digital e-course, and this was the title of the course. For the low, low price of $99, you, yes, you, can learn to raise the debt. Wow. This is a real thing. They had a promo video. They had, like, shareable links. It's like, for the low, low price. I ain't even got to pray. I just got to swipe the debit card, and I am there for the low, low price of $99. My mind immediately ran to the story in Acts chapter 8, when Philip goes into Samaria, the city gets turned upside down. They call for Peter and John to come and lay hands on people that they would get filled with the Holy Ghost. And there is a sorcerer there named Simon. It's also my daughter's cat's name now that I think about it. <laughs> Simon the sorcerer. I knew there's something not right in my spirit. His name was Simon. And do you know what Simon says? He looks at Philip and Peter and John and he says, I will give you money 
if you will give me the ability to do what you just did, if you will give me the ability to lay hands on these people and that happen when I pray for them, I'll give you money. And Peter goes post. Peter says, I perceive, this is King James, I perceive that you were in the gall of bitterness. That's not good. Whatever that is, that is not good. I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And this is what Peter says. And you need to pray to the Lord and maybe, we're not even sure, maybe he'll let you repent. (laughs) That's a big maybe, Peter. We want all of this stuff following us for all the wrong reasons. So if all of these miracles and all of these great things and all of your Instagram followers and all of your influence, if that's not the fruit, then what is the fruit? The fruit is if you are the difference between a wolf and a sheep is the wolves devour the sheep. It is how we treat our neighbors that discern between us and wolves. And Jesus, I'm going to shut up with this. I'll shut up with this. Man, you can come on. I got a lot more I can say, but I won't. Jesus calls these people hypocrites. Hypocrites. Now, we were sure that we knew what the narrow gate was. We were sure we knew what the fruit was. And now we're sure that we know what the hypocrites are. The hypocrite, of course by any definition, is somebody whose private life and public life are not the same. Right? You need to be the same person in private that you are in public. And of course, you, you, we're not, not encouraging you to be duplicitous. And if your private life and your public life are one and the same... We call that having integrity. And nobody's saying amen because you know where I'm going. You're like, I ain't saying amen. This is going to tell me that's wrong. That's what the students do. They're like, wait, can we amen yet? Because you're probably going to tell us we're wrong. (laughs) But integrity is not the language that scripture gives us. You need to have integrity. Don't misunderstand me. You need to be the same person in private that you are in public. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not the language that Scripture gives us. Scripture calls us to something beyond integrity. And for Jesus, a hypocrite is not somebody whose private life and public life are different. The Pharisees' private life and public life were not different. They weren't praying in the temple and secretly addicted to porn. They were as holy in private as they were in public holy looking in private as they were in public. And he calls them hypocrite. Because a hypocrite is not somebody whose private and public life are not the same. I know plenty of people whose private life and public life are the same and you still don't need to follow them. For Jesus, the hypocrite is the one whose life is different than Jesus' own life. Not your private and public life different, but his life and your way of life different. The way he treats the prostitute and the way we treat them, that's hypocritical. The way he treats the gay community and the way we want to treat them, that's hypocritical. That's why he doesn't call us to integrity. He calls us to something deeper. He calls us to holiness. Which does not mean my private and my public life are the same. It means his life and my life are the same. It's how you treat that person in Walmart that's biologically a male but dresses like a female. It's how you treat them. Are we affirming that? Don't even get... Don't even start. No. Of course not. We're, we're, our private life and our public life are the same. We hate them in private and we hate them in public. We speak ill of them in private and we're bold enough to speak ill to them to their face. 
because we got integrity. But what we don't have is his holiness. And he calls the Pharisees hypocrites for the very... Do, do you understand that what was so hypocritical about them was their very own theology was harming others. Their very belief was harming others. If this man were a prophet, he would know that this sinner lady was touching him. But we become so secure in our own moralism that we feel like we have the authorization to judge everybody else around us. When he starts off by saying, before you start throwing rocks, look at all of the ways that my life and yours are not the same. Yeah, I know you're not committing all the big sins. I know you're not stealing money and addicted to pornography and all that stuff. But look at all of the ways that we are unlike him. So before you wind up and start slinging rocks, check the log in your own eye. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, great theologian, he says something, it's very troubling. I've thought about this for a long time. It's very, very troubling. He said that, you know, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Now listen, before I say this, make this clear. I'm not saying I believe this. I'm not saying, I'm for sure not saying the rant believes this. This is something Thomas Aquinas said. And he lived 800 years ago. So He said that God so wants us to be humble to the world, to not be elevated in the pride of our own holiness, that when, he, when Aquinas was commenting on Paul's thorn in the flesh, and Paul is praying to God to deliver him from that, Aquinas believed that that thorn in Paul's flesh was an actual lesser sin that Paul couldn't get free from. That God allowed that sin to plague Paul so Paul would not get too puffed up in his own morality. Because whatever pride takes hold of us when we know we're walking the narrow gate is profoundly more sinister than anything we judge in anybody else. This is why the early church would say pride is the mother of all vice. We don't talk about pride. We talk about filters on your computer. We don't talk about pride or how prideful we get because we don't need a filter on our computer. So, yeah, there's that. Pastor Jacob told me to preach on loving your neighbor. I don't know that I did that, but I love y'all. No, you don't. No, I'm kidding. Stand on your feet. In your presence, in your presence, the most broken people should feel the most safe. No, you're not affirming sin. Please grow up beyond that. No, you're not affirming sin in anybody's life. Neither am I. But the most broken people if we're following Jesus faithfully, the most broken people in our com community feel the most safe in our presence. If you follow Jesus' life, women and children felt completely safe in his presence. The only people threatened by him were powerful men. Prostitutes felt fine in his presence. The teachers of the law did not. Corrupt tax collectors, yes. Rulers of the synagogue, 